So they're eliminating the lottery and it's going to be an open process. As of January? As of, that's the announcement that we heard today, that their intention is to do it uh, by January. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's it's going to be tremendous for Ontario. Uh, it's going to be tremendous for us as producers. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's going to be great for the community, too. Uh, you know, giving the producers the ability to sell directly to the consumers, uh, finally, we can we can compete with the black market. Uh, you know, the, the prices, the black market has dropped their prices um, in the last couple of years uh, because, of course, the legal market came in as this top layer of pricing, you know. Yeah. Uh, but uh, if people can come here and know they're buying regulated, fully legal product, get exactly what they want and still pay seven, eight dollars a gram, then why would they? do something illegal and go to the black market. The problem is that everybody's charging 10 to $15 a gram. Uh, and so, you know, that, that changes the equation. So I think this is the sea change we've needed. You know, this is the shift that um, is going to put things in uh, a better position for Ontario and for legal cannabis in Canada altogether. So basically, uh, background for us, I began as a patient. Um, you know, I was very ill and I started growing into the MMAR for myself. Uh, and then we formed a collective, patients and growers. We began interacting with people in the community who were coming to use cannabis uh, for um, medical purposes. And over the years, as we researched growing methodologies and as we grew to understand more about what this was about, I came to the conclusion that there really isn't a distinction between recreational users and medical users. Uh, they're the same people. They're just giving a different narrative to what they're doing, you know? Um, some people say, oh, without cannabis, I don't sleep well at night, but I like it to, you know, relax and have a good time. Both of those things are true, uh, you know? And uh, the fact is that a healthy person is having more fun and more is more relaxed. And so I think there's always multiple facets, especially with a drug that's as complex as cannabis is, you know? Uh, there's over 200 known phytocannabinoids. Uh, I believe that's the case. And, um, you know, the, the way it interacts with our system has unexpected effects. So we will offer all of the same products in both avenues. Uh, so we won't make a distinction. There's only one product, which I think we're going to have to wait a couple of years to roll out to the recreational industry, um, which is a pure CBD uh, flower that we grow. Um, it's a great product. I love it and I use it daily. But the problem is that people are trained to look for THC. Yeah. Uh, and so I think it's going to take a little while for people to understand that they may want some of both. Uh, but I am going to roll out a product uh, that we call Wagner GE. Uh, that's a two to one CBD to THC. It's a fantastic product. It's relaxing. It's mellow. Tastes great. And it isn't... Flower? It's a flower. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I named it uh, after my grandfather, uh, uh, which we named the company after him too. But this particular strain, I thought he would have very much enjoyed it. So. Uh, you know, when we got it from a seed and we got that particular pheno, I thought it was an opportunity to uh, to name one uh, Wagner. So um, it's a great product and uh, I think people are going to enjoy it. It's something that um, leaves you a little bit more functional than, uh, say, Northern Kush, which is a 24% uh, THC product. Uh, but there's room for both and I'm hoping that people recognize that. And I think the more retail exposure we have, the louder that conversation gets, you know, uh, and I think people will understand more about what's going on in the cannabis industry mm -hmm. uh, and sort of be able to enhance and, um, uh, you know, create complexity in their experience of cannabis. I just want to mention before we head in there um, that this is the largest group that we have ever toured. Um, now, the reason that we put a limit on that is because the grow rooms are not designed to accommodate large groups. Uh, so we're going to have to spread out a little bit. Uh, we're going to have to make sure that we don't bunch up too much because that's going to mean that, you see this uh, gentleman, I'm sorry, is Phil? Or no, that's Doug. Doug. That's Doug, sorry. Uh, there's Phil. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, the way you're leaning against the clothes rack there. If we were in a grow room and those were plants, that's not allowed. So we got to keep a little bit of distance um, because it's very possible for people to have, uh, you know, bacteria and other contaminants on us. So uh, we'll just have to be aware of that and try and be as careful as we can because this is uh, people's medicine, and uh, you know we got to keep it clean and safe. Sure. Okay. All right. So let's head in. So the uh, speech I normally give as we go into the grow room, rather than the one I just gave, is that um, we are, you're not required to wear gloves when you're in the grow room, but if you feel like you're going to be touching anything with your hands, 
please grab a pair of gloves when we get in there, okay? Uh, I will pick things up and give you a demonstration and show you how everything works, uh, but that means no equipment, no walls, no um, you know, plants or anything like that, okay? Yeah. All right, so when you come up to the door here, you're gonna enter your code and then scan your card. We'll head on in. So this is our vegetative room. Uh, I'm going to give you the full tour. A lot of you uh, already know a fair bit about cannabis, but we'll do it anyways. Um, cannabis is what's called a photoreductive plant. That means that it has two distinct life cycles, a vegetative phase and a flowering phase. Uh, in this room, we provide the plant with about 19 hours of light a day. Uh, which keeps it in the vegetative cycle. Now, if you were to maintain that lighting cycle, you could continue to grow a cannabis plant indefinitely, uh, as large as an oak tree, if you wanted to. Uh, it's all uh, available to the plant in its genome, as long as it doesn't switch over. Uh, but when the plants are ready, we're gonna move them into one of our flowering rooms. Now, today we were just cutting down some of the plants that we were using as mothers. After we harvest the clones from the mothers, we then push them on into the next phase, the clones, and the mothers are harvested. Let's head down to the back and we'll talk a little bit about cloning. Uh, this is a, a proprietary system that uh, we created. My brother and I actually had a lot of fun figuring this out. Because oh, you cannabis, invented this? Absolutely, yeah. Well, yeah, my family did. Um, the uh, cannabis is a plant that is very different from many other kinds of plants in terms of the way that it grows and therefore the way that it clones. Uh, the stem is very woody. And we all know that hemp fibers are some of the strongest in the world. Uh, and uh, as a result, it's difficult for us to permeate the stem. And we need to apply hormones, we need to break down the outer tissue of the stem so that it can grow roots. Uh, so what we do here is we use a tiny slip of rock wool. Uh, we clip the end of the stem and then we put the stem in the rock wool. Uh, these um, here are a special plastic piece that we have uh, injection molded with a local company who's a partner of ours. Mm -hmm. uh, we call all of this, of course, the growth storm system. So uh, once they're in here, the end hangs down below that board. Uh, and it dangles into a running stream of water that we create in these trays over here. We use a large volume of water in relation to the total biomass here so that we can maintain a consistent chemistry. But that wick draws up just the right amount of moisture uh, and helps us to break down the waxy layer on the outer part of the stem and encourage it to grow uh, new roots. So this is a unique type of system that has a high um, efficacy. It usually works about 90 uh, to 98% of the time, depending on the strain. We've got a couple of difficult wow. ones to clone, but uh, you know that's uh, really just a, a variation genetically. So what's uh, the other, uh, another possible way to clone? You talk about the, the efficacy of this being yeah. about 90%. Yeah. What is it in, in traditional cloning? So traditionally, people use what's called the rapid rooter system. Yeah. Uh, and if there's home growers out there, you may have encountered this tech. It's a peat plug technology. Uh, you uh, put the clone into the peat plug, and then you put it in a tray. Problem is, because the tray is uh, relatively small and doesn't contain much water, uh, the chemistry varies over time. The peat plug is not really ideal for transmitting the water into the stem. That system was originally designed for cloning tomatoes, uh, and it's been adapted for use in the cannabis industry, but this has been specifically engineered for cannabis, mm -hmm. uh, which gives us a completely different result. And there's another key factor here which we can manage that that system can't. Let me grab a rooted cutting and I'll show you. So these clones are ready to be potted up. Let me grab one and I'll show you. These are actually a little day or two overdue. You can see we're starting to get some browning on the roots. Uh, they need to be moved into their next home. So what we've achieved here is an even mix of roots all the way around the stem. And now we're gonna peel away this rock wool and plant it in the next phase. And that's a beautiful cutting, very little chlorophyll loss uh, and uh, lots of root growth. So it's gonna make the transition very well and move on to the next stage. But because we're an aeroponic grower, roots matter more than anything. So we have to have the right rooting. You can't get just one root growing out of one side. If you were growing in soil, eventually that would spread and it would cover the whole pot. Uh, but for us, we need to be able to spray and apply that spray all the way around the plant. So we need that full corona of roots. And that's what this system gives us a high percentage of the time. It's also a low cost method. You know, those rapid rooter plugs will cost you uh, about 80 cents a piece. They work about 80% of the time. So you end up paying about a dollar per rooted plant. This system, we end up paying about six or seven cents per rooted plant. But, uh, <laughs> I was just talking to you, there's, a, there's no soil anywhere in this building. That's correct, yeah. We do use a small amount of an inert substrate. But, uh, At the moment, we use a couple of different substitutes uh, that we're testing. Uh, let me show you what that looks like. Uh, now, we used to use these flood and drain steps a lot. 
Uh, but we're actually getting away from that and moving to a new technology that we are pioneering here. So let me pull it out and I'll show you what those roots look like. So here we've got some nice roots that are hanging down uh, in the correct array. Now these roots are not truly aeroponic roots, but they're going to make the transition to aeroponics much more smoothly. And this plant's going to be ready to go into one of our main enclosures in the next few days, and it'll be ready for flowering in less than a week and a half. So it's moving along quite quickly, or maybe two weeks at most. Does, uh, does it grow faster aeroponically? Does it cut down on cultivation time? And, and Absolutely. And what, what is that? What's the ratio between traditional grow and then aeroponic grow? You know, it's always difficult to define. Everybody's growing their own way. Um, so what we end up doing is about two weeks in the cloner as a maximum, and then about four weeks in veg before we move into uh, flowering. Now we do screen train our plants. Uh, you know, a plant uh, like this, many growers would put into flowering like this, and this plant is about two or three weeks uh, in the vegetative cycle. Uh, so we get very quick growth. Um, and uh, you know, that is because of aeroponics and because of pseudo aeroponic techniques like this. Uh, you know, true aeroponics means that we have to mist the, um, the roots with a nutrient solution. So uh, these plants here have been in an aeroponic enclosure for just a few days. Big and balance all the way around there. That's right, and that's yeah. what we want to see. But the transition from flood and drain is not very smooth. These are our flood and drain systems over here, the ones that we're replacing. But you can see that these roots up at the top, they're used to a much higher moisture content, mm -hmm. so they're going to have to rot and go away before these roots are really truly healthy. Uh, but uh, plants that transition um, from those sites over to this grow much more quickly and much more robustly. Let me show you what a, a mature root mass in an aeroponic enclosure looks like. These are beautiful plants, mother of blueberry, very strong blueberry flavor. And uh, we end up with a nice root mass. Now these plants would be ready to go into flowering. You don't want to let the root mass get too large uh, because then it can begin to become unbalanced. and It's difficult for us to spray the whole thing. But this is right where we'd want to see it normally when we're heading into the flowering stage. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so these ones are being kept as mothers, which means they have a bit of a different future ahead of them. Uh, but you can see how the roots are now full all the way down. We've got a full corona all the way around. Mm -hmm. So the spray that we use can adhere properly to the plant itself. Uh, and that's what you want. Now it's really interesting to see the roots of a plant because we don't often get that opportunity, but you can see they have some rigidity to them. Uh, they're not just a, uh, you know, a loose mass. They interlock with each other. Uh, in many uh, operations where there's a soil, they apply pressure to each other, which can limit the plant's growth. In an aeroponic setup, you don't get those limits. So the branches grow very dense and the branches grow very heavy and the size of the plant becomes very large and uncontrollable. So we have to control everything by timing. Uh, but this plant would have been uh, about uh, four weeks in veg, maybe five at the outside. It is a little bigger than we'd need. These ones here are more appropriate for going into flowering and they've been screen trained. Just like a Christmas tree, the hormonal yeah. pattern here dominates the rest of the plant. Yeah. Uh, but um, you know what we want is to create flowers that are all the same. Because this flower here could have as much as 15% more THC or active cannabinoids than the flowers at the bottom of the plant. Mm -hmm. We don't like to see that That's variation. That's traditionally the case, right, with That's cannabis right. plants, is the, the this higher is normal. concentration of tea, uh, THC is at the top. At the top. Yeah. That's right. So we, you know, we don't like that to see that between batches, much yeah. less within a single batch. Uh, you know? So what we do is we train out the plant. We make it so that these top branches are now convinced that all of the branches are equivalent in a hormonal sense. Uh, and then we're going to strip away all of the extra branches from the bottom of the plant and just target what we're doing here at the top to create the correct array of flowers so that we get a consistent outcome, uh, consistent size, shape, So you, you know exactly content. what you're getting, exactly what you're going to put on a label in, in every product That's by right. how you've grown it. That's right. Now we're never going to be perfect. This is an organic system and perfection is impossible. Yeah. But what we aim for is as narrow a range as possible. Yeah. We want to be sharpshooters, you know? Yeah. Uh, so there are products on the OCS right now that range between 8 and 28% THC. <laughs> Uh, you know, it would be kind of like buying a bottle of wine that was somewhere between 2 and 12% alcohol. Uh, who really knows, right? Uh, but our products tend to range by about 2%. Uh, so, for instance, the Northern Kush uh, will go between 25 and 23% THC. Uh, in that category, you still know the effect you're going to get. It's still a high THC product. Uh, and we find that that's a good way to build trust with our patients and with our customers. Um, you know, build a relationship over time. And so that's, uh, so that's sort of our mission, to mm. use these technologies to manage precision on that scale. Yeah, you don't, I, I, you don't hear that from many growers where, where you talk to them about the products that they have, and they talk more about the products they're coming out with, but not necessarily um, 
how they achieved what they've achieved to get those products out right. of the market, right? And exactly what's in them and what the, what the goal is, the precision. Absolutely. I haven't heard anybody talk about the precision aspect of it. Which is funny to me because, you know, we talk a lot about craft cannabis. Yeah. What is craft? Now, we grow at scale. You know, we've got 50,000 square feet of uh, flowering space. We're going to produce 10,000 kilos a year. But each one of our plants is closely monitored throughout its life cycle. The control that we're able to exert means that we're able to craft a precise outcome. And that's the care to me that means that we're a craft grower. Yeah. Uh, and so I think, you know, it's that something- That does craft growing at scale. That's right. no one in this country does. Because the system has to be designed from the ground up. Yeah. Everything that we do, uh, you know, these two plants here, we've selected plants that are as similar to each other as possible. And then we tie them into a single reservoir. We use a system of distributed reservoirs throughout our facility. The amount of nutrients that we put into this reservoir is tracked all the time. Uh, and uh, every time we come to look at this reservoir, we're going to record how much nutrition is left in it, which means we know precisely, down to the microgram if we want to, what these plants have consumed. Mm. Uh, and throughout the entire life of the plants, we can build this record. Uh, you know, it's kind of like when you talk about central fertigation, you know, uh, it's kind of like imagining a room full of Olympic athletes, all different sports, and you're just going to feed them frozen dinners, you know. Uh, that's not going to get top performance from them, and it's not going to get consistently top performance in all of their different endeavors. Yeah. So for us, we need to know exactly what our athletes need, what they're eating, what we do leaf samples to determine the ratio between um, administered nutrients and absorbed nutrients, uh, and that allows us to precisely target what we're giving, just like a nutritionist would for an athlete. Fascinating. Uh, and I think that's, you know, it's, a, it's an important element of what we do here, but it's an important element that, you know, the industry at large needs to consider. How are we controlling these processes in order to ensure quality? So here's a question for you. <clears throat> You've got, uh, this, is, this is a family business. Your grandfather taught you everything you know at the age of 12. First showed you <laughs> That's what I, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I think uh, we went a long way beyond what he envisioned. I'm, I'm uh, paraphrasing. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, so, so uh, but you, the same care that you learned to care with this plant with, the same, the same love that you have for this plant that your grandfather showed you and your, your family through generations, is, is the same care that you're putting into bringing this to scale. Yes, which, I, which is exactly right. It, it, like it, not a lot of, a lot of people in, in, our, in this industry are, seem to be jumping into the business. Not a lot of people have started uh, with a generational recipe and the care that's involved in being able to grow the plant and have the vision to be able to bring it to scale as well. I think it's a unique set of conditions we've got here at JWC. Yeah. You know, I don't think there's Very any unique. other CEO in this industry who got into this industry because they needed cannabis for a medical condition. Uh, you know, I couldn't, I wasn't able to hold down any job when I started growing cannabis. Uh, and, uh, you know, this, everything that we built here is because of cannabis. Mm -hmm. So there's inherent passion in that. And I do think that that's why we named the company after my grandfather. Not because of the way we grow. By the time he passed away, he used to say that what we do is more like magic than farming. Uh, you know, but in the end, the passion that he brought to his work and the way that he looked at the relationship with the plants and with plants in general is something that we try and carry forward as an organization. Mm -hmm. And that's what it means to us to be a family business, to mm -hmm. maintain those values that are at the core of what we've been doing for a long time. But not a lot of family businesses, uh, businesses pardon me, are as innovative as your family business. You know, I, I haven't seen a lot of this. <laughs> family businesses traditionally, or this is what we do. Yeah. You know, we're in the business of shoes. We're in the business sure. of making rocking chairs. We're, we're horse people. Yeah. Uh, but the innovation uh, that, that, that happens in a family business like this is a little odd, too. Well, there, was a, there was a specific jumping off point, because as a patient, I started growing, and I started growing in um, a peat moss type uh, medium. Uh, and sometimes we would do well and then sometimes we would do very poorly. When we did well, my health was good. And when we did poorly, my health was not good. And so we came to a very visceral realization that the way we do this has to be consistent. We have to be able to control it uh, or else we leave our health to chance. And that's where we diverged from the traditional because cannabis is a plant that's unique. You know, uh, it has um, over 230 known terpenes uh, and uh, other flavoring elements. Um, between 140 and 200 phytocannabinoids are present. A tomato has 20 to 30 terpenes that give it its flavor. 
this is a crop that's an order of magnitude more chemically complex than other food products. So we can't approach it with traditional means and expect to achieve results that are truly on a medical level. Yeah. Uh, we have to be able to go beyond that. So we didn't get into this thinking, hey, let's invent a new way of growing anything. Instead, we were faced with a problem that we had to answer. And in answering it, we answered a problem that affects a lot of people. Uh, and it's a problem that affects this industry right now. Um, and it's been our focus for over a decade. So that gives us a, a bit of a head start, hopefully. <laughs> what a story, man. Great yeah, story. Thanks. I, I love, I, I could listen to the, uh, to, the, to the heart behind what this business is because you don't hear it often. You know, yeah. We've traveled long and wide to talk to people about this business because of the verticals that we have in this business. And no, you're, I hear you're you. unique. Your story Thank is unique. you. I appreciate that. Yeah. There's a lot of people in this uh, industry who, you know, if they stop doing what they're doing today, they'd find another industry and move on. Uh, you know, I'm always going to work with cannabis, no matter what the future holds. So, please do. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll get you to try some product, and then you can attest to it. All right. All okay. right. Okay. I think we've collected the entire tour group. Yes, here. we're good. So let's move on and have a look at. Now we don't have anything that's near the end of the flowering cycle. No worries. So we're going to have a look at some of the rooms. Unfortunately, I can show you some pictures of. Uh, we harvested a, a batch of cherry diesel earlier this week. Amazing product. It's unique. Uh, the buds on it grow this big around uh, in many cases. Uh, it's our highest yielder per square foot. In many cases, when we go to pack a five gram package, we have to break up the buds in order to get down to that level. Oh, so too funny. On the way out, you just scan your card. Okay, bud. Yeah, there is a difference in yield. Um, you know, a lot of companies can report as much as 350 grams per square foot. Uh, at this point, you know, we're up to um, as much as four to 600 grams per square foot of canopy uh, in a year, in a year. Uh, so individual crops uh, that we have now can yield as much as uh, 120 grams per square foot. You know, for another grower our size, using like advanced substrates like coco coir uh, or materials like that, can spend millions a year in bringing soil in and taking it out. Man hours and material costs is huge. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's wasteful too, like our um, water use profile is minimal because we only give the plant what it needs, you know, we don't have to make sure that the material around the plant is humid because we're, there is nothing there, right? Uh, so we don't throw away water in that regard. Nutrients delivered are delivered direct to the plant, so we use fewer of those. Uh, and in the end, you know, that's what efficiency is really about. Aeroponics is the only truly sustainable means of cultivation. Everything else uses a resource that has to be replaced. Uh, but here, you know, we, reclaim our, we can reclaim our water from our HVAC units and use it again. Because the plants bring the water in and then they transpire into the air and then we pull it out of the air and put it back into the plants. Um, you know, the plants, the leaves themselves absorb energy from photosynthesis. Right now we're looking into... Is that an idea of sustainability too that was important to you? I mean, it is important to me, and the more that yeah. we learned about this, and the more we examined these concepts, uh, the more important it became. Yeah. Um, because these are processes that can't be sustained forever. You know, people talk about organic cultivation as the ultimate in sustainability. But we gave up on organic cultivation in the early 1800s when we started using fertilizers yeah. because we couldn't support the population. And the fact is that those organic elements are a matter of diminishing returns uh, between uh, 160 and 200 kilos of material out of this room. Uh, you know, within a day of harvest, everything is removed and we're ready to sterilize and start again. Um, you know, we do a really intensive sterilization of these spaces every time we do a harvest. Uh, so first we remove everything, we scrub every surface. These ducts come down and they go out to be laundered and we scrub inside all of those boots. All of the equipment gets clean. Uh, and then, after that, we spray everything down with a sterilant, which is an accelerated peroxide that they commonly use in operating theaters. After that, we hyperozonate the space, bringing it up to levels that uh, would uh, affect any organism that was in the room. And then as a final step, we heat sterilize the space. Uh, but within the room, we do a lot of really interesting things. You can see um, this is a, about a 5,500 square foot room. We keep our plants in rows. The equipment has been designed so that every segment of the plant can be accessed. So each of these tables can be pulled out a line. Now my arm reaches to the middle of the canopy. So if I need to check a leaf here, yeah. I can reach it. If I need to reach a bud in the center, well, others might need a ladder, but uh, I can still reach it there. Uh, and that's the way we would design all of our equipment in order to be mobile. 
so we can make sure that the plant is healthy at every point. So I just want to stop here for a second and uh, explain why this is my favorite place in the facility right now. Uh, these hallways are what I call the traverse hallways. You can see that they're about 10 feet wide, which would allow us to pass tables beside each other. The grid of flowering room pods will extend in that direction, it'll extend in that direction, and it'll extend in that direction. Uh, already, this can be a confusing place to wander around for people who are new here. Uh, so by the time it gets large enough that we've got a three by three or four by four grid of these pods, we'll color code each one so that you know where you're standing uh, in the facility at any given time. But I like it because here, we're standing in the middle of 44,000 square feet of flowering space, 45. Uh, and uh, you know, years and years ago from where we began growing uh, first just a couple of plants for myself to what we've built today, uh, it's a humbling experience because it's taken the effort of hundreds of people for us to get here. Uh, so I always like to pause and remark on that as we get to this <laughs> point. Good for you. So this is Hash Plant. Uh, which is a really nice strain. It's going to get some really nice sized buds on it. Um, now we're going to come through and trim once more um, to take out some of the bottom branches and then from then on it's just defoliation, defoliation, defoliation. We don't want there to be many leaves left on the plant by the end. We want to try and take all of the excess leaves off to give more penetration to light so that the buds can grow larger and See bigger and better. Right. These plants are only about three, three and a half weeks into the flowering cycle at most. Yeah, it's actually only two and a half weeks. So we've got some really good bud mass here for that point in the cycle. And uh, yeah, we're looking at a good crop here by the end. It's, uh, it, it is amazing the consistency that you get. I, 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 again, haven't seen that before where you walk into places and they've got big bushy plants, but what you're striving for, you can see. Yeah. Excellent, thank you, yeah. Really. All right, let's go look at Depot. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, where we started. So to be honest with you, I'm not really sure what's flowering in here right now. I know that we've got some plants that are just uh, finishing out the vegetative process here, getting ready to go into flowering, but um, this is another pod, although it looks fairly different than the ones that we've been in. Um, when we originally started at our pilot facility, we only had 10,000 square feet um, to grow in. And uh, of course, one of these pods is about 20% uh, larger than that. So um, we laid out rooms that look very much like these rooms, um, and we just laid them out as we could fit them in the space. Now these rooms, the size of them is based on studies that we did under the MMAR, where we looked at the risk factors involved in growing multiple plants in the same space. Yeah. Um, but because we do a lot more here to make sure that we keep everything clean and safe, uh, we figured out later on that we could make the grow rooms about uh, four times the size. And because they're four times the size, we can be more efficient. We can fit five times as many plants. I like math. Um, and so we always were recording data about the plant and that data got tabulated into spreadsheets that showed patterns over time that gave us new ways of looking at the information. Uh, so about three or four years into our uh, cultivation efforts under the MMAR, uh, we started to gain a better understanding of that math and learn about the risk factors, you know, looking at cubic feet of canopy within a given space as a risk factor for infection. Uh, it's kind of like um, if you imagine you know, it's that the larger the crowd of people, the more square inches of skin you have, and so the greater the chance you can be exposed to a disease, right? It's the same thing with plants, except uh, we often talk about how tall or how wide the plants are, but really what you need is a cubic foot measure of canopy space, which is your risk factor. Uh, and then one of the big advancements we made is that we realized that a lot of aeroponic setups, they put all the roots together in a single enclosure. We don't, and the reason is because contiguous root masses, root masses that touch, uh, are causing a additional risk of infection. So by pulling them apart, we can make sure that each of those plants is separately maintained and protected. So are you using like some kind of like computer software with AI to like try to... To look at the data? Yeah. One of our QAs is, um, has talked about working on that. Now, what we look for are what, what are called immediate correlates or first order correlates. They're things that are obvious, you know. Right. Um, it's only obvious once you have a whole bunch of data uh, and you can put it in the, you know, the right uh, sort of form and look at it. Second order correlates are a lot more complicated. 
Um, they are things that don't appear obvious from the data, but with a large enough pool of data, you begin to see patterns emerge. Right. And for that, you need advanced software. Um, and so we are going to be moving into that, and it is something that uh, we have our eye on, uh, but it's beyond my skill uh, in terms of math. So we can go have a look at our uh, giant water filtration system, if that's something that's interesting. Yeah, to for sure. Okay. All right. Here we are back in our main hallway. I actually didn't mention this earlier, but I call this uh, hallway the infrastructure backbone. All of the water distribution system and uh, electrical and so forth ties into this hallway. Uh, and whenever we build a new pod, we're either connecting on the hallways that come off of here or connecting directly in a grid away from here, uh, which means that it's much easier for us to add new spaces than it would be if we were building uh, just sort of a hodgepodge wherever. Uh, and it's also why all the rooms follow a grid pattern. So this hallway runs the entire length of the building from one end to the other. Wow. So who, when, you, when you decided to do this, did you have the, 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 the plan for how you wanted to do it with the pod system, the, the aeroponics, uh, and, and when you guys decided that this was going to be the facility that you, you, you wanted, did you, has, has this evolved or has this always been your plan as to how you were going to grow out? So, when we took over our pilot facility, we knew we had a technique and a technology that worked. Yeah. We saw the potential, but we had never implemented it at a commercial scale. So we had a lot of learning to do about how that was going to work. And we spent the first couple of years just figuring that out. Um, you know, in late, uh, or sometime in 2018, we discovered this building. Uh, and I immediately started drawing um, the plans for what we have here today. I just wanted to pause here for a moment and point out our shop. Uh, a lot of um, places like this, a lot of cannabis uh, grows. Um, a shop is just sort of a footnote, uh, but for us, this is sort of the hub of what we do here. Do you talk about the sustainability portion of what you guys do in your messaging? More and more. Um, you know, yeah. it's not primarily um, what we're about. You know, it's about creating a good quality product and doing it in a really controlled way. But the, the um, oh, by the way, yeah. is, a, is a big oh, by the way for people. Well, people Especially are more and more concerned community. about yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. And I think there is a lot of misunderstanding about what it means to be sustainable. Um, you know, field cultivation feels more sustainable to people than what we do here. Uh, but the fact is that, um, you know, it's, NASA did a lot of research into aeroponics. And they researched aeroponics because the math is on our side. When you have to transport everything you need to grow plants into space, the cost of those things becomes that much more magnified. And at that point you realize that you have to carefully track everything that you use. Um, and that's what we're all about. And when you get to that level, you realize those closed loop systems are the only ones that are truly sustainable in the long run. Um, and so. No, no soil, no organic. Exactly. Yet exactly. It's more organic than anything that's in soil. Well, what does organic mean? <laughs> yeah. You know, and that's the question. Dude, the you, you unfortunately might just have to redefine the word. So when do you start, as a company, when do you start putting out product? For the recreational market, which what what is your plan? As soon as we can, uh, you know, we just signed with um, Kindred. Uh, they're a great organization. They're going to help us get our product to market, market our product across Canada. Um, you know, we are very focused on what we do. Mm -hmm. We're a company that develops technologies and cultivates cannabis. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's not really our mandate to get out there and take on all these other verticals. Um, then, of course, you know, we're going to follow up with the hash and rosin uh, pre rolls. Excited about that, you know. A lot of companies out there are doing these, <laughs> big, you know, one gram pre rolls, which is great for you know a group this size. Um, but uh, you know, to just buy one of those is a big investment, and it's you know is something that most people. I'm not going to you know judge, but most people would you have to do a couple of different sessions to get through that. So we're going to do. Uh, so for Phil. There you go. That's what I said. I'm going to judge. <laughs> <laughs> I know people who would go through a big one grammar as well. But, um, there are lots of different reasons why you would want different product forms in different situations. Uh, but if you like a particular kind of uh, you know, cannabis, then we're going to make it available to you in all those different forms. Uh, and I think that's something that's a little bit different. It's more of a, you know, a, a full spectrum way of looking at that product lineup. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we're excited to do something like that. Okay. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's a. <clears throat> I mean, just seeing how people are trying to figure out what their entry point is. I know I've used that word a couple of times or that phrase. 
but uh, trying to figure out where the entry point is uh, in recreational and trying to gauge exactly what the government's responsibility is right now and when they're going to allow you know people to be able to not just advertise but talk about the benefits and talk about what these products do and educate people which is still such a massive area and I think it's something that our friends here at Canada's Wiki do such a great job of something that we try to do too is is educate people as to not just the uses, not just dosing, but educate people as to the lifestyle and really the solutions that, that, that are found in the plant. But, you know, a guy like myself, I can smoke flour, but it has to be cut with tobacco. Uh, otherwise, I cough my guts out. Yeah. And I just it's just one of those things. I, when it comes to vapes, same thing. Really? So, yeah, it's, it's a bizarre, it's a bizarre thing. So, you know, the, I have a, I, there are certain types of cannabis I use. There are certain types of... of of uh, products that I use for different situations, but again, it's all solution oriented, and right. I know I come back to that. Well, but it's a good way to look at. It. But sometimes the solution is going out and having a good time with my friends. Too, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yep, psychologically, that's an important solution to keep in the arsenal. Absolutely, it is. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious. Were you? Uh, did you smoke cigarettes before you started smoking cannabis? So yeah. Longer? Yeah. Okay. Interesting. I have the same issue. Yeah. Uh, I think it's the click in the back of the throat. Yeah. And it's, it is. Um, you know, a lot of... Um, Can you get it removed? <coughs> no, it's just, it's the way you draw on a cigarette versus the way you draw on a joint. Um, so if you um, just use your tongue to draw some into your mouth with a joint, with just a pure to, um, uh, cannabis joint, uh, and then breathe in, that's very different right. than the way you draw on a uh, cigarette. And the heat of combustion between the two materials is different, so it affects your throat differently. Uh, so give it a shot sometime, if you can, and let oh, me know how it goes. First and then inhale it. You just in your mouth, then suck it back. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Changes the way it feels. Like Ali hiding from the cops. <laughs> 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 well, listen. We appreciate you. Uh, you you yeah. spending some time with us today.